from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, with sponsors this broadcast. We're privileged to have as our guest for this program Ambassador Henry Cooper, who, if anyone can be characterized as the uh, leader of uh, our programs for strategic defense in this era, it is uh, Ambassador Cooper. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He was director of the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization during the Bush administration. And uh, when uh, Dick Cheney was defense secretary, he conducted a major independent review of the SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative Program, and related policy issues. The results of Ambassador Cooper's uh, examination were instrumental in reversing the SDI funding cuts, uh, which Congress had previously uh, mandated. He also served as President Ronald Reagan's chief negotiator at the Geneva Defense and Space Talks, successfully defending SDI in these negotiations which what was once called the Soviet Union. And in fact, this year, he received the Ronald Reagan Award for his work uh, in the area of defending the United States of America in space. He's done many things. Uh, he was chairman of Applied Research Associates, senior associate of the National Institute for Public Policy, and he's been a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation. In the private sector, he was senior vice president of JCOR, deputy director of the Nuclear Weapons Effects Division at R&D Associates, and was a member of the technical staff at Bell Laboratories. In addition to having been an ambassador, he holds a PhD from New York University in mechanical engineering, and he's got BS and MS degrees from Clemson University, which is based in his native state of South Carolina. He and his wife, Bobby, a lovely lady, have two daughters, a son, and eight grandchildren. And uh, it's a privilege to have you with us, Ambassador Cooper. Let's talk about what's happening uh, in space. Uh, what, how has uh, the federal government's policies towards space changed under Barack Obama? The biggest change has been to basically kill the manned space program. Um, they limited the budget uh, to some degree at NASA, but more importantly, the, the direction of the programs was explicitly to uh, uh, curtail or eliminate the programs that had been ongoing during the Bush administration to return uh, to the moon and basically to use that as a basis for developing a transportation system and uh, uh, that would replace the shuttle at some point as well and to revive a serious manned space program. So that's the greatest casualty, I would say, of their space Why program. is it important for America to have a manned space program? Uh, there are many reasons, I guess, you could give um, that we need the challenge for our young people. I believe, uh, as it was in the Kennedy era, uh, space is still the uncharted frontier, if you will. Um, and it was a great motivating force for many young people. I w was in college uh, during uh, at least part of that. Sputnik <coughs> went up at the beginning. I remember that. That was 1958, was I believe. 57. 57. October 57. But, uh, and then I was at Bell Labs. Uh, Sputnik, by the way, for our viewers, was a Soviet right. uh, jump into space, and it terrified the United States of America during the Eisenhower years. And it was a good thing in the sense that it spurred us to intensify our efforts with regard to space. That's exactly right, not only to get to space, which uh, a couple of years later we achieved, but uh, uh, President Kennedy, Kennedy announced, uh, I believe it was in 61 or so, that uh, a, a challenge to the community as a whole to go to the moon and with a man's program and return him safely by the end of the decade, which with, I like to say with slide rules and nomographs and lots of young people who were excited about the challenge. Uh, we succeeded uh, in less than uh, it the was eight, a great eight, accomplishment nine years. of President it was, Kennedy. It, it was. Uh, the challenge was, and it was completed, <clears throat> as, uh, as you remember, 
uh, during, I guess, the Nixon years? Yes, or what, I 69, believe, I think. I believe, I believe that's right, first, first return to the moon. And it wasn't too long after that that the program was I remember was I was curtailed. in San Diego when it happened, and I watched right. it on the television. Right. So it was a, it was a great thing. Uh, uh, and killing the program, losing the vision of going there, I think, was, is a great loss for the nation. Strategically, it is important, too, because we now face an era where China is a growing power, I think, as most Americans know, economically and otherwise, and they have adopted a goal uh, to go to the moon themselves, I believe, by the end of this decade, but uh, as early as perhaps uh, 2017. What are the national security implications of China racing ahead of us in space? It's the byproducts of doing that. That's one thing. Uh, establishing uh, preeminence in time in space, it is the high frontier, uh, and there are strategic implications for that, too. There, there are political arguments uh, that China supports as does Russia and another a number of other nations to not militarize space, for example. And that's basically to keep America in a holding pattern uh, so that we don't fully exploit the technologies we have to deploy particularly space-based defenses, which are the most effective way to defend the United States of America and the rest of the world for that and matter. And the, the right. true theory of higher ground right. uh, victories in uh, military conflicts. That's, that's the history. And I think uh, they're succeeding in their strategy of, uh, of keeping us from doing this. Even the Bush administration, the last Bush administration, although they got rid of the ABM treaty, which blocked our path into actually building such a defense, they didn't do anything to revive the programs that the Clinton administration had killed, the programs I left behind. And we could have had uh, space defenses long before now uh, the Obama administration, I feel sure, is going to do nothing to revive those. And I uh, fear that uh, China will, uh, will preempt us in this who, way. Who in the Senate and the House is providing leadership on this issue? Well, the most knowledgeable man on Capitol Hill, I believe, is John Kyle, Senator John Kyle. I uh, worked closely with him when he was in the House and on the Armed Services Committee, and he knows these issues with respect to um, uh, defense generally, missile defense uh, specifically, and he understands the importance of space. But the problem is we don't have the votes, and he's now the whip, as you know, uh, the minority party among the Republicans. So he knows we don't have the votes, and he's trying to use what he can in the way of strategy there to uh, achieve uh, objectives uh, as best he can. There's no way he can revive the space program alone, acting alone. We need leadership out of the executive branch for that. And uh, who in the House is active on this issue? Uh, I would say that um, a congressman uh, from Arizona that, in fact, I believe is in the seat that uh, John held when he was in the House, and I'm sorry, I'm having a mental block right now, can't remember his name. Um, Maybe it'll come to me in a minute. That's no, no problem. He cha anyway, he, he leads the, the House Caucus on Missile Defense. And I, he, <laughs> forgive me. No, I hope. that's quite all right. Now, uh, Obama, in the course of gutting manned space, has been involved in canceling uh, the Constellation, the shuttles, right. and any plans to go to the moon or Mars until decades from now. I don't, I don't think he has a plan at all. No. So um, the, uh, the 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 focus has been put back on what he would call the research activities uh, at the university and so on. And meanwhile, we're pretty soon going to be dependent on other nations for launching uh, heavy payloads. In now, you said that we ought not leapfrog over the moon before we uh, go for Mars and so forth. Why is it important for us to return to the moon? I think it's important for two reasons. One uh, may be less, um, more subtle than the other. One is because uh, it's an important stepping stone. Uh, moving out beyond uh, the moon into deeper space means exposing uh, men to radiation levels and activities that, uh, in, uh, in an environment that we have no experience whatsoever in. And I think we need to reestablish uh, ourselves on the moon to do that. Secondly, I don't believe as a long-term matter uh, we can sustain with government funding a serious spanned space program. 
So I think it's terribly important to have commercial interest um, that will sustain the program. It's just like what opened the West. It wasn't just the excitement of going there. It was a way that you could build a new life. Uh, you could build business. You could, you know, grow and prosper. And that's true with the moon as well. All of the materials that you need, for example, uh, to, uh, to build uh, solar cells exist on the moon. The minerals are there. One of the missions that I started during the SDI area uh, was a Clementine program. You may remember it, Howard. It was our first return to the moon in 25 years, in fact, and it mapped all of the surface of the moon, and I think it was 13 spectral bands over uh, a million frames of data, more, more than was taken during the entire Apollo program, and we discovered water in the polar regions, or at least we thought we did, and that's been confirmed now a year or so ago with a, with a mission that sent a probe to the surface in the polar regions of the moon. So we have water. When I say water, it's ice, of course. And uh, the basic elements there that can sustain life, uh, of course, in a habitat environment. You have to build that. And then you have to, with robotics, build the materials there, take the materials there and build the solar cells, beam the energy back to Earth. You can use the SDI technologies. And I'm talking about essentially near-term technologies. I'm not talking about advanced studies at this point. Um, and, you know, there's enough energy that's incident on the moon. I think it's in two days or so to fuel all our power needs on Earth. Mm. So this is not a small thing. And so you can imagine how you could build an in industrial base. Once you're there and you are exercising uh, 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 you know, system that way, and, and this is clean energy, by the way, that's a buzzword these days, um, then you have the means, I think, in the private sector to sustain even deeper space operations. So that's one of the reasons, that, one of the main reasons I want to go to the moon. Ambassador, we're going to have to take a break okay. here. Uh, we'll be back after these messages with Ambassador Henry Cooper, uh, chairman of the board of High Frontier, and perhaps America's leading expert uh, on the civilian side uh, with respect to U.S. activities in space, inner and outer. Uh, please stay with us. We're going to talk about the commercial uh, aspects of uh, space involvement, what's happening there, but we're also going to focus on something called New START and its implications for our national security, not just with respect to space, but in other areas as well. This is the supposedly strategic arms reduction treaty, but it's a treaty which uh, favors uh, the former Soviet Union by a 10 to 1 margin in certain areas, and one which uh, would be very dangerous for U.S. security if it's ratified. We need to find eight senators who vote against ratification. You might be able to help. Stay with us. Uh, we'll be back with Ambassador Henry Cooper right after these messages. You are a defender of liberty. You spoke out. You were heard in Congress. No. You marched. You created a new movement. You endured attacks. You see folks waving tea bags around. Now you can help to repeat our bill. Go to sendthemamessage.com. Print the pledge to repeal Obamacare. Send it to your representative, senators, and candidates to sign that they pledge to repeal the bill. 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 Now. Go to sendthemamessage.com and help. Repeal the bill. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable. We're privileged to have as our guest the leader of High Frontier, Ambassador Henry Cooper. Before the break, Ambassador, we were talking about uh, the need to involve private uh, funding and interests 
in our space program and not depend entirely on what the government does. What progress has been made in that field? Well, as I was explaining, uh, Klaus Heiss, who was my colleague at High Frontier uh, and regrettably passed away this past year, was leading an activity that uh, in which we had several conferences in Europe and in the United States to flesh this I idea out, including at Georgetown in the business school there to look at the merits of uh, going this way. And we had discussions, serious discussions going with uh, um, capitalists, venture capitalists, as well as uh, the technical community. I had a partner in doing this of Mike Griffin, who had been my deputy at SDI and was the NASA administrator and basically said if we could get this team together to work this idea, which he agreed was, uh, was a smart thing to do, uh, and were willing to put the money up to do that part, they would provide the transportation. Now, when, when, when uh, Obama killed the programs, they cut, cut us off from that path. And frankly, I see as uh, uh, a serious stra strategic loss in this, when the Chinese get there, they will do this. Whoever yeah. is there will take advantage yeah. Of, yeah. of the minerals and all the rest that are uh, plentiful. And, and we may be cut off from access right. to those We're, by the Chinese. It's not just, uh, it's not just a, a, a fun space uh, yeah. trip, you know. It's for real, and it's a stepping stone to going to deeper space, in my judgment, because it'll, it'll pay the way for going further. What kind of surprises are in store for us as we go into deeper space? What we, may I, we learn? I really don't know. Uh, there's a lot of unmanned space programs, probes that have gone there over the years. I don't claim to be an expert in the knowledge base uh, that we've, we've uh, gained. But until you go there and you experience uh, a trip that takes as long as it does to go to Mars, for example, uh, there, are, there are radiation thre uh, threats, if you want to put it in those terms, hazards, um, that I don't think we understand. Weightlessness in that, for that extent. I know you're in contact with Buzz Aldrin and perhaps some other astronauts. What role, if any, are people who have been astronauts playing in building support yeah. for reservation of, resurrection of the U.S. Well, role in space? Aldrin uh, spoke out, I think, immediately with the cancellation of the program against it. Buzz has too. Buzz is, is an advocate, as you know, of a program that sets as the target Mars, and I don't have a problem with that so long as you don't uh, you lose don't lose the, the the necessary step of going to the moon and accomplishing what I so said. We have to consolidate I, uh, I think our advantages of the moon before someone else jumps I, in there. I believe we do. I, I believe we do. Yeah. And regrettably, the programs we have in place now sort of opens the door for others to get ahead of us here. Obama has been a joke. We were talking off camera about uh, Obama suggesting that NASA, one of NASA's tasks is to get Muslims involved in uh, space. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, good luck to them if they do, but what has that got to do with the defense of the United States of America? Uh, nothing, as best I can tell. I have, I have no, uh, no argument against there being Muslims as part of the team that goes to space, but to make that as a priority sure. objective, I think. It's absurd. Now, uh, what impact would the ratification of START II have on uh, our space program? The new START? Uh, it's in the, I would say, in the missile defense area is one of the areas that really troubles me. There are a lot of things wrong with this treaty, in my judgment. The biggest one uh, is the fact that uh, there's no limitation associated with the tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, so-called battlefield weapons and so on, where the Russians have, by some public yeah. accounts, maybe 3,000 yeah. or so, and, and, and uh, they outnumber us by great and, measures. Uh, and their rail mobile activities and are, they are have not rail restricted. Mobile. Uh, they, the, 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 this treaty, people allege it has the same verification measures as did the START treaty that was a part of the negotiations I uh, was involved in. Um, and uh, it's just not true. The verification measures are not as strong. And they didn't obey them anyway. Well, that's also true. The Russians are violating the, those treaties even as, uh, as a And one of the things that concerns me about uh, New START is the lack of clarity about uh, what restrictions may be imposed on the United States with respect to SDI and other space related right. activities. The Russians have one version. Our government says, well, we'll have to work that out later. Well, they have preambular language, which yeah. some people want to say doesn't matter. 
uh, you know, because it, and it says there's this linkage between offense and defense. I heard this all for five years. I spent five years at Geneva arguing with them about these issues. I know exactly what it means, and it has great political consequences, which I recognize from my time in running the SDI uh, program subsequently. The political reality, uh, reality of the world that we'll operate in is that the Russians will complain, and not necessarily their friends in Congress, but people who don't want the controversy associated with challenges to what we're doing, where we're charged with violations and so on, will frustrate any real program inside the Department of Defense to build, for example, a space-based defense. At the same time, they'll be seeking to prohibit space-based uh, military operations. And uh, all of this is not good for us because China and other countries are going there while we, we diddle. Talk to us, if you will, about Aegis and oh. all the things the, the Navy is doing with respect to defense. This is a sense of real pride to me because I, on my watch, um, along with the support of Admiral J.D. Williams, I mention him by name because we were the pair that persuaded the Chief of Naval Operations to join the missile defense programs in the SDI and uh, to begin serious work on sea-based defenses. The ABM treaty had been set up in such a way that you could not even test a sea-based defense if it could protect the United States of America. Mutual assured destruction. It was all part of that, and it's you know one of the things coming back. Anyway, we got the program started, and our friends on Capitol Hill kept it going uh, during the Clinton years. Um, and then uh, during the Bush years, uh, I would say the Japanese, who joined forces with us and provided, I think, on the order of a billion dollars in supporting the program, played a critical role in insisting on the interceptors on board the ships being compatible with the infrastructure of the Aegis system. And, and now we have defenses on 20 ships, I believe, uh, and I think there are three or four that the Japanese have and we've got the makings of a global defense at sea. Yeah. And unfortunately, the Chinese are making great progress in being able to immobilize, uh, destroy mm. uh, many, the not just our aircraft carriers, but other. Right. The fleet. The there, fleet. There is a potential challenge to the fleet, and uh, we need more effective defenses. I don't want to suggest to your viewers that the job is over on the sea base side. We still make, need to improve what's out there. I think the programs are to have some 40 ships. That we have 80 in the fleet, but about 80. By 2015, I believe, we'll have the defenses operating on 40 of our ships. And we need to give them the capability of defending folks in the southeastern part of the United States yep. against ships that might launch short-range missiles yep. off our coast yep. towards cities here. We don't have well, a We think that we are in insulated coast. by the Atlantic and the Pacific, but no, we are it's not. It's not true anymore. Just not simply true. not true. We're going to have to take a break. When we come back, we'll have about uh, two minutes of uh, concluding comments by Ambassador Henry Cooper. And you're fortunate to be watching this program because there's no one in the United States better informed on these issues than uh, Ambassador Henry Cooper. Please stay with us. We'll be back. Hey, listen, this is the greatest thing. I want to tell you something. Something's happening in this country. And I want to tell you, look, at, look around my friends here. My friends here in Washington, come over here. See all these great people? <laughs> these great folks are here because they want to take the country back to the direction of the Founding Fathers and stop all this nonsense that's going on and stop this, uh, you know, this uh, immersion into socialism, which is happening. We've got to stop it. And every day we're losing a little bit of our freedom. But the, the answer is that the, the, that the individual citizens can make a difference. They can walk through these houses of Congress. They can look, at, look their congressmen in the eye and say, hey, vote this bill down. Get rid of it. we got a lot of work to do. And the, the first thing we have to do is get rid of the garbage and the attacks on our freedoms. This is it. So anyway, that's what these guys are doing here today to do. Yes! And, uh, and I say, all of you guys out there, where it was the sound of my voice and the, and the, you know, the visual that, you're cre that this great gentleman has created, get down here and do your, do your uh, responsible citizenship by going and seeing your representatives and telling them, you know, 
what you want because this is this is your house. It's not their house. Yeah. Get in there and tell them what to do, and let's uh, let's begin cleaning this country up. Is a, a big yes. mess has been created in only a year's time, in nine months' time, really. A big mess we have to recover from. We got to start work. We got to throw some people out. So anyway. I love this country. I love you. Go do your job. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, please check out our website, www.conservativeusa.org. Or if you want, without cost or obligation, some literature concerning this topic and others, uh, write to us, uh, TCC, 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia. Ambassador Cooper, uh, it's an honor to be with you on this program. I always learn something when I listen to you, and I'm sure our audience has learned much from your comments. What uh, closing comments have you in the minute which remains? Yeah. If I could speak uh, to your audience, I Please do. would just like to say that I think the most important thing over the next 90 days or so is to defeat this START treaty, New START, it's called. Uh, and um, it's very important. I think Howard mentioned we need eight votes to, I think we have uh, enough votes short of that to uh, block the ratification of the treaty. We need 34 votes altogether. Uh, Senator John Kyle, who is the whip, is the counter of these things. and. We need to work on the weak sisters, if you will, uh, to, um, to uh, block this treaty. It's critically important. They'll be back for a couple of weeks in September. Uh, the Senate will. And then probably we'll have a lame duck session uh, that will go on uh, through the election and uh, through the assignment of the new Congress. And it's very important not to have the treaty come into being during that period. I second the motion. I agree with you on everything you've said. Ambassador Cooper, thanks for being with us, and thank you. Please join us for the next Conservative Roundtable.